Hey, welcome to Sweet Home Evangelical Church Online. I'm Pastor Brian here, and uh, uh, I, I hope you'll be patient with me today. I'm not doing so great. I had uh, root canal surgery a few days ago, and I got stitches and stuff in my mouth and just still feel like I got punched in the face <laughs> for an hour. And so we're going to charge ahead here. But uh, uh, today we're talking about prayer. And when's the last time that you, you, you got an upgrade or an update on your prayer life? There's all kinds of upgrades and updates in life, aren't there? Uh, the Oregon Jamboree is going to be starting uh, later this week, uh, just right over there. And uh, that's a big deal here in town. And they updated the Jamboree tickets. Uh, now they've got like a special wristband with a chip in it. They're updating over by Safeway, a couple blocks away. They're tearing down old buildings, they're putting up a new Taco Bell. Every now and then I have to check my phone and my computer for updates. But when's the last time you updated your prayer life? That's kind of a strange question, but are you still operating on a prayer life that is not up to date and it's just muddling through and you're not working on getting closer to God. Uh, see, that's what we need to do in prayer is we're trying to get closer and closer to God as possible. Uh, here at the church, our, we have adult Sunday school Bible study class at 915 on Sunday mornings and for months and months they've been digging deeper and working on prayer. Uh, but have you done this for yourself on purpose? Today we're starting a short three-sermon series on prayer. Some of you are doing great in your prayer life. Some of you are struggling, but all of us can improve. And it's good for us to take a renewed look and see if we can upgrade our prayer life. You know, if you could ask Jesus for one thing, what would you ask for? Uh, would you ask for... Ask for, you know, your why questions. Why did life turn out like this? Why did this happen? Or why didn't things work out the way I had hoped and planned? Uh, would you ask him for maybe some winning lottery numbers? You see that Powerball jackpot up to a, a good amount. I need those. What would you ask for? You know, Jesus' followers, his disciples, they had this opportunity. Luke chapter 11 tells us that they came to Jesus one day and they had a request. And they didn't ask Jesus how to do that miracle where he took a little bit of food and fed thousands of people. They didn't ask him about how to walk on water. Uh, they didn't ask him how to calm storms. What did they ask him? They said, Lord, teach us to pray. Why? Of all the things they could have asked Jesus, why did they ask this question? I think it's because they saw the result of his prayer life. They saw everything he did was the result of how he spent time in prayer. They saw him pray. They saw what happened. The disciples, they watched Jesus preach the greatest sermons ever. They watched Jesus do miracles, heal the sick, cast out demons, but never did they say, Lord, teach us how to preach, or Lord, teach us how to do that miracle. Instead, they came to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. They saw that this was the spiritual support system in his life, and there is nothing more vital in your Christian life than learning how to pray. You know, I have a day timer, and I like writing things down and trying to stay organized, and, and then, I, you know, then I can cross things off my day timer when I've, I've accomplished it. It makes me feel good. And, and in my day timer, I feel like, you know, I, I, I think I'm planning my life, but in reality, none of us really knows what's going to happen because things come up all the time. We live in an uncertain world, and we need to spend time in prayer, don't we? I never watch the news and then say to myself, wow, this world is doing pretty good. I guess I can kind of, you know, back off on my prayer life. I guess the world is doing great and don't need to spend any extra time in prayer. No, never. This world is uncertain. This world needs prayer. 
And sadly, the average Christian knows more about politics or Dr. Phil or college football than they do about prayer. There's a lot of faulty misconceptions about prayer uh, and a lot of just plain not knowing how prayer works and how we pray, why we pray, and all of that. So I've got kind of the two-part sermon today. The first, basically one-third of the message is prayer is not. So I got four things prayer is not. Uh, some people think prayer is a first aid kit. It's not a first aid kit, but they, for them, prayer is an act of desperation. We only use this in case of emergency. And for a lot of people, prayer is like that. It's a last resort. When things finally fall apart, that's when they pray. Uh, and uh, it's kind of like the guy who came to the pastor and they were talking about situation in the church and the pastor says, well, I guess all we can do is pray. And the guy says, really, are things that bad? <laughs> Some people think prayer is just this last resort first aid kit. The second one, some people think that prayer is a magic wand. Uh, magician, they wave the magic wand and say the magic word and rabbit comes out of the hat or whatever. Remember the old TV show, I Dream of Genie? Uh, you know, the astronaut, Major Nelson, he had all kinds of problems because he has this pretty genie following him around and she means well, but chaos happens every time she tries to help him out. And a lot of people view prayer like that, where you got a genie in a bottle, you rub the bottle, God comes out and says, your wish is my command, and you put your prayer in, and you're supposed to get your answer. But God is not some sort of cosmic vending machine. It doesn't work like that. For some people, prayer is a tug of war. Uh, they think prayer is a, a tug of war, this religious game you play where you're pulling it and back and forth and you're trying to convince God to do something nice for you. Uh, the idea is that you have to beg and plead and God is some cold-hearted monarch sitting a million miles away in outer space and you have to urge and beg and plead to convince him that he ought to do something nice for you. The worst idea out there, the worst misconception about prayer is that for many people, prayer is just simply a religious duty. The basic motivation behind that is guilt. And we tell ourselves, well, I know I should pray more. I ought to pray. It's something good Christians do, and so I ought to do that. And then it becomes a duty. And you have you have this sense of obligation that, well, if I don't pray, then I'm going to be on God's bad list, and then I won't get a good Christmas present or whatever, and, and prayer becomes a meaningless ritual, and it becomes a rut. And you learn memorized phrases, and you get caught in religious cliches, and you say the same thing over and over, and it's meaningless to you, but you know that you ought to do it. And when you think of prayer, you think of one word, and that word is boring. Why do I have to pray? And it becomes something you endure rather than something you enjoy. And if prayer is a duty for you, you've missed the total point of prayer. In the next, oh, we got a couple more Sundays after this, we're going to look at prayer, and we're going to look at what prayer is, what prayer isn't, how do we pray. And we're gonna, today we're going to talk about what is prayer. Why do we do this? What is, what is the whole purpose of prayer? Lots of religions have prayer. Lots of religions, they talk about prayer and they have prayers. And lots of people pray, but what does it mean for us as Christians if we're going to follow God and follow God's word, what does that mean for us as Christians to pray? In the Gospel of John, John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, these are the last words Jesus had to his disciples. Jesus is at the Last Supper, the night before he was crucified on the cross, and there is this long discussion, and Jesus is telling his disciples repeatedly, I'm going to die, but it's okay because I'm going to be resurrected, and, but then I'm going to go back to heaven. I'm not going to be with you physically, but I'm going to be here spiritually. I'm going to leave my Holy Spirit with you. 
and you can still talk to me, even though I'm not here physically, you can talk to me through prayer. And Jesus gives us, here's what prayer is. Here's why we pray. Here's the purpose of prayer. Number one, okay, we're up to the outline here. Number one, prayer is an act of dependence. It's an act of dependence. It's not independence. A couple weeks ago, we did 4th of July, uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, oh my word. You know, I was up in Canada for 4th of July. Uh, yeah, they, well, I was up, they do Canada Day on July 1st, and that's their sort of Independence Day when they got some limited independence from the British monarchy. And there's hardly any fireworks. I mean, here, 4th of July happens. There's fireworks every neighborhood. It just sounds like downtown Baghdad. I mean, there are fireworks going off everywhere because we love celebrating our independence. But prayer is not independence. Prayer is dependence. It is dependence on God. We're saying, God, I cannot do this myself. I need you. And our biggest problem in prayer is we don't feel a dependence on God. We think that we can do it ourselves. Ever since Adam and Eve, we have vastly overestimated our own ability. And we go, we go on thinking, well, I don't need to pray because this is something I can do. I got this one. And the biggest problem in prayer is admitting that we need God's help. Uh, the reason a lot of people don't pray is because it costs us this honesty where we need to be honest with God and, and admit that I am inadequate, I am helpless, I can't do it, I need God's help in this situation and every situation. I think we sang a song maybe last Sunday or a couple weeks ago, I don't know, but it, it, the old song, I need thee every hour, every hour, all the time. And, and, you know, but too many people, they view prayer as a first aid kit where they only go to prayer in case of emergency. And as long as you think of yourself as independent, self-sufficient, prayer isn't going to have any meaning to you. But prayer is our declaration of dependence on God. It's our way of saying to God, God, this, this is just me showing that I totally depend upon you. Jesus gives the illustration of a plant. He's at the Last Supper, and he's talking to the guys, and Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch, and withers. such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But... If you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. That's like a blank check there at the end, isn't it? Ask for anything you want. He says, if you really put your dependence on me, you can ask for whatever you want and I'll give it to you. That's an unbelievable promise in prayer. It's like this, this branch and the vine and all that, and, and, and the branch needs to be connected to the vine. It's just like when you do some yard work. You cut off some branches, but you, you don't pick them up right away, and they sit there for a few days. They wither up and die pretty quick when they're not connected, don't they? And, and that's what it is. We, we, are, we need to be connected to God. Prayer is our declaration of dependence on God. Number two, prayer is an act of petition. Prayer is an act of petition. Here in Oregon, we love petitions. Uh, I, mean, I haven't seen it for a while, but it, normally, you know, in Oregon for years, uh, there's always somebody out there wanting you to sign a petition, right? And trying to get something on the petition so you could do something, getting all these signatures on a petition. What, what a petition is, it is, it's a request to the powers that be that things will change and that we can get this on the ballot or whatever. But prayer, and the, the petition is a request that things will change. And that's a big part of prayer. Uh, it says in Philippians 4, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank him for all he's done. 
And then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. The result of our prayer is peace, peace of mind. We're get, the, uh, we give our petitions to God, and the result is peace. Prayer is an act of petition. We're not waving a magic wand. We're not saying magic words. We are making our requests known to the Almighty God. Jesus tells us in John 16, verse 24, I tell you the truth, you will ask the Father directly, and he will grant your request because you use my name. You haven't done this before. Ask using my name, and you will receive what you, uh, and ha you will have abundant joy. He says you're going to be happy because you're going to ask, and I'm going to answer, and you're going to be filled with joy. Prayer is God's chosen method for meeting your needs. The Bible teaches us that there's some things that God has promised to do only if we pray. Some people think, well, I don't need to pray because God already knows what I need before I ask. Well, you know, and God will just give it to me when the time is right. Well, that's not entirely true. God has set up his plan where there, there are some things where you only get them when you ask. You, he, he tells us we need to ask. When we read the New Testament, the New Testament Christians, they were unbelievable. They were happy, joyful, contagious, enthusiastic about life. They had power in their lives. They saw miracles happening on a regular basis. And we say, how come we don't have that kind of power? Why don't we have that same kind of power they had in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, in the early church? And the reason is we don't ask. In the book of James, it says, you do not have because you do not ask God. Over 20 times in the New Testament, the Bible tells us to ask, ask, seek, knock, keep on asking. What are you lacking right now in your life? It's, maybe it's simply because you haven't asked God for it. You've tried other things, but you've never stopped to ask God for it. It says in Psalm 37, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Not just your needs, but the desires of your heart. Why is that? Because if you're delighting yourself in God, if you're trying your best to, to let God's Spirit live in your life, your desires are not going to be wrong. And prayer is an act of dependence. It's an act of petition, asking God. And number three, prayer is an act of cooperation. Prayer is an act of cooperation. This is exciting stuff. We are not in this tug of war with God, where we're trying to pull something out of God. We're trying to convince God to help us. God wants to cooperate with you. He wants, you to, wants us to cooperate with him. Prayer is this act of cooperation. You see, God has chosen that we can cooperate with his plan by praying and helping see his will done here on earth. Prayer is God saying, I have chosen to limit myself to what I can accomplish on earth simply by limiting myself to the faith of my children here on earth. What they believe me for, that's what I'm going to do. When we pray for other people, we're cooperating with God. We're teaming up with God to accomplish God's wor work in this world. One of the most amazing verses in the Bible is in John 14, verse 12. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I've, been, I've done, and even greater works, because I'm going to be with the Father. That's amazing. Have you been doing what Jesus has been doing? You've been raising the dead, healing the sick, walking on water. I admit I haven't, okay? This is a tough verse for me to wrap my head around. I don't see myself doing greater things than Jesus, probably because I have a lack of faith. And it's kind of hard to believe, but the Bible says anyone who has faith in me is going to do what I've been doing, going to do even greater things. 
How is this possible to do greater miracles than Jesus? Well, that's simple. We don't actually do it. It's accomplished through prayer. By prayer, when we pray, it can do greater things than Jesus did while he was here on earth. Why is that? John 14, 13. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so the Son may bring glory to the Father. Over and over again in this passage, Jesus says, you ask, and I'll answer. You ask, I will do it. He says, your part is the asking. Ask in my name. Put it on my tab. Ask. Your part is the asking. My part is the doing. And that's great because he's in a whole lot better position to do more than you and I can. Here's a few more, he has a few more strings he can pull, a few more resources at his command. He says, if you pray, I'll do it. Our part is cooperating with God's plan here in this world. We're not trying to pull it out of him. We're cooperating with what God is doing here on earth. And number four, prayer is an act of communication. Prayer is an act of communication. You know, most of our problems in life are communication problems, aren't they? I mean, we misunderstand each other all the time. Uh, lots of TV shows and sitcoms are based on somebody has a misunderstanding and then chaos ensues after that. And most of our problems in life are from poor communication. And, and you can't understand God and God's will for your life unless you communicate with him unless you speak, but also unless you listen. Many years ago, I had, uh, oh, I had a couple girls in youth group that they didn't get along. And uh, there was uh, this girl, uh, Jessica, maybe that's probably not her real name. I can't remember her name now. Uh, but Jessica, she was a loud, bold, fun, a force of nature. She was a born leader. And she was tough, she was strong, she was awesome. And one day, Jessica opened up, and then all of a sudden, I mean, she is, she is, she's, she's in tears because there's another girl in youth group, uh, and I think they went to Seven Oaks School or something, and, and I mean, this other girl from the youth group was so mean to her, and she just, she'd see her at school, and that other girl would just give her this look, and, and it would just make her feel so bad. And, and so, well, then I got the other girl, and I said, what's, what's the deal here? Jessica's in tears because you're mean to her at school. And she says, I don't know what she's talking about. We never get a chance to talk at school. And uh, so I brought those two together, and they wanted to be better friends. And both girls, they talked together. They cried. They hugged. And this junior high drama had a happy ending here, okay? Their problem was they weren't talking to each other. And so they really didn't know what each other was thinking. Prayer is an act of communication. You can't communicate with somebody unless you have a relationship with them. What is our relationship with God? It says in John 15, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so the Father will give you whatever you ask using my name. He says, the reason you can ask for anything in prayer is because we are friends. Isn't that amazing? God says, I don't treat you like servants or slaves. I treat you like friends. We have a hard time praying because we fail to recognize what a privilege it is to talk to the Almighty God. Jesus was talking to a group of Jewish guys they, they lived in a culture where uh, the temple was the center of their religion. They were in Jerusalem at the time, but they were all from Galilee. And Galilee was home for all of them. And to get from Galilee area down to Jerusalem, you got to walk for a good four days to go to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, you got the temple. Now, if you were a Gentile, you didn't get to go in the temple. 
Uh, you could only go in the temple if you were Jewish. And you could only enter after you did ceremonial washings. And you could only go so far if you were a woman. Women could only go so far, and then they had to stop. And men, they could go a little bit farther and go to the area where sacrifices take place, but then they had to stop. And then there was the holy place uh, that only the priests could go into, and they could only go their unofficial business. And inside the holy place was the Holy of Holies, where the, Indiana Jones keeps the Ark of the Covenant. And, and there at the Ark of the Covenant, only the high priest could go in there, and only once a year. And it was such a big deal, they actually did. They would tie a rope around the ankle of the high priest, just in case there's a medical emergency inside there, so they can pull him out. Otherwise, they'd have to wait a whole year to get him out of there. In the scripture, it talks about when Jesus died on the cross, the temple veil was torn. That means there is nothing separating us from God. We can come to him through prayer. Jesus changed everything. We can go to him in prayer. We can boldly enter the throne of grace. And you are invited to communicate with the creator. Our problem is we have a hard time believing that God really is interested in us. And we can't seem to conceive that the creator of the universe is interested in us. And it, that he's interested in car payments and house payments and that guy at work that irritates you and the fact that your back hurts and you got a, you got a root canal thing and stitches in your mouth and all these things. But when you fully discover how much God really loves you, prayer will no longer be a duty. It will no longer be an obligation for you. It won't be something that you just have to do. The problem is not, I have to pray. The problem is, you don't really realize how much God cares about you and loves you. Why? Because we love to talk to those who love us the most. Isn't that true? We love to talk to those people who love us the most. This is why I like spending time with my wife. This is why uh, we all like spending time with family. It's summertime. People are spending time with family. We love to spend time and talk to people who love us the most. If you find prayer a duty, a ritual, a routine, and you don't look forward to it, that means that you don't yet understand how much God is in love with you and how much he's interested in everything that is of interest to you. Prayer is an act of dependence. It's our way to express our dependence on God. Prayer is an act of petition where we ask him what we need. You have not because you ask not. We need to ask. Prayer is an act of cooperation where we're partnering with God, with what God is doing here on earth. And we pray and we work with God and God kind of points us in the right direction of here's what he wants done. And prayer is an act of communication. You know, and if things don't work out the way we want, that's okay, because we're still communicating with the one who loves us the most. If you're struggling with your prayer life, take these to heart. We're working on upgrading our prayer life here. Let me pray for you. Lord God, I pray for each one watching and listening, that you would watch over them and bless them. Help us to Recognize that prayer is not a first aid kit. Prayer is just our dependence on you at all times. Lord, help us recognize that prayer isn't a magic wand, but we are actually coming to you with our petitions, asking you. Prayer isn't this tug of war with you, but we are uh, coming to you and we want to cooperate with you and what you're already doing. And prayer isn't this religious duty, it is communication with the one who loves us the most. And Lord God, we thank you that you love us. Help us to follow you and to spend more time with you. Lord, help us to know you more and more. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for joining me. Lord bless you. Um, 
Oh, coming up, uh, let's see, on Tuesday we'll do overtime and, and later this week we'll do midweek update uh, and see how that goes. Hey, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.